Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jenny Ford. I serve as the Executive Director of the Moscow Chamber of Commerce and Visitors Center. Today, we are hosting our Latah County Candidate Forum. Thank you so much for being here. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, I just want to um, push a friendly reminder for those of you um, that are interested in supporting the Latah County Fair. As you know, the fair is looking quite differently this year. We don't have a carnival, but those um, kiddos in 4-H and FFA, they really do need our support through the uh, virtual live auction. And so you can find that on the Moscow Chamber of Commerce community calendar, but the bidding starts on Friday, September 18th at noon and ends on Saturday, September 19th at two. In addition, later this month, or excuse me, at the beginning of October, we are going to be hosting a District 5 legislative forum and that is going to be taking place in the evening from 5 30 to 7 p.m and that will be virtual as well just so you all know through our facebook live page it is um, my pleasure to introduce our sponsor for today's luncheon um, the lake Talk county board of realtors is our sponsor today and the representative that's here is jess dollinger she's the current president of the lake Talk county board of realtors and is an associate broker with lake Talk realty the mission of the lake Talk county board of realtors is to provide members with education and resources that enable them to conduct their business successfully, to build strong relationships between realtors and their communities, to promote and preserve private property rights, and to uphold and enforce the Realtor Code of Ethics. It is my pleasure to introduce Jess to the lectern. Thank you, Jenny, and thank you all for being here today. Um, allowing the Latah County Board of Realtors to sponsor this event. I think it's very important for our community. Um, the Board of Realtors really strives to be a good resource in the community through education, charitable works, involvement, just as you are willing to do and serve as well. Um, so again, thank you so much for doing this and we're proud to sponsor it for you. The Moscow Chamber of Commerce relies heavily on our supporters and we really appreciate the support from the Board of Realtors. Thank you so much. In addition, we are going to hear from Henry Ann Westbrook. She is going to give the audience some information in regard to elections coming up. So really important stuff. So it's my pleasure to introduce Henry Ann to the lectern. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the Realtors. Um, I have four main topics I'm gonna to talk about. It's gonna be polling places in Moscow issues with mail concerns, how to absentee vote, and poll workers. So to get started, um, we will be setting up four polling places in Moscow. As always, we have the nice big fairgrounds, and uh, the event center there will hold 11 precincts. Then we have recently added the Hamilton Indoor Recreation Center. There will be four precincts voting there. And new this year is the U of I campus polling place. We will have four precincts voting at the Student Rec Center on the U of I campus. We chose the four precincts closest to the campus for that polling place, as we did at the Hamilton Indoor Recreation Center. Those four precincts are basically your northern precincts, two, three, four, and 17. Every registered voter in Lantau County got a letter from me. I told them where they need to vote. I also encouraged them to absentee vote and sent to them an absentee request form. They can either mail that back in or they can drop it at the courthouse in our new programs. There has been concern about mail. And I've tried to address this issue. I've contacted the local postmasters in our county and I've asked them to please safeguard election material. All of our material is marked election material. Every flap that we mail out will have a fluorescent green tag and it will be um, designated as election material. I also call the regional office over in Seattle and I asked them, do you have any sorting machines that have been taken out in our area? The answer was no. I don't feel we have a mail problem in Lantau County. Also, as a rule, we have three mail precincts that we always mail to and have for years. We have never had any problem 
mailing those ballots out and getting them back. It's all worked just fine. Um, the other piece to this is um, after every election, I go through any ballot that came back that wasn't able to be counted. And I look at the postmark and I say, should I have gotten this? Was it mailed timely? I've only found two pieces of mail that have ever reached that level of concern. I called that postmaster because they were both from the same post office. And I said, we had a problem. Please make sure election material comes through. I have a good relationship with the people in Lake County that handle the mail. And I don't foresee that we're going to have a problem. Now, as you know, because of the COVID virus, we are encouraging absentee voting. We have 24,000 registered voters in Lytok County. That number is artificially high because we have a transient uh, student population. But according to our data, 33% of Lytok County has already requested an absentee ballot. And you might think that sounds really good, but I'd really like to see that number double. So if you haven't requested your absentee ballot, go online, download the form, drop it off or mail it to us. You have until October 23rd to do that. The other way you can do that is go to idahovotes.gov. If you have any problems navigating the state system, while you're on the computer, pick up the phone, call my office, 208-883-2249. Let us walk you through it. It can help you register to vote, and you can also request your absentee ballot there. And what's really nice is after you've requested your ballot, whether you did that by paper or whether you did it online, you're going to be able to track your ballot. It's going to say, yes, I see that I'm going to get a ballot. Then it's going to tell you, oh, I see my ballot was made. And then it's going to tell you, oh, it looks like they got my ballot back. So we really like the new software. It's brand new. We worked hard to try to get up to speed on it and learn it. It didn't come out until after the May primary this year. So kudos to my staff for jumping in there, learning this new system and moving forward with it. Another important deadline I wanna talk about is you have until October 9th, that's three more weeks. If you're not registered to vote, you need to do that. Don't be intimidated about registering to vote if you're an older person and have never voted. I know that a lot of people are in that category and maybe because of the recent re-engagement of uh, people into the voting system, they feel concerned about that. So don't be concerned. Call my office. We'll help you get registered. If you're a brand new voter and have never voted, it can be intimidating. We're here to help and we want to help you. We will be having early voting from October 13th to October 30th. It will be in the basement of the Lake Tuck County Courthouse. You'll enter by the 5th Street door on the north side of the building. We will triage you as to whether you are a current registered voter and need to go register or whether you can proceed on down the hall to room 7B and cast your ballot. So again, October 13th to the 30th. We will also be offering two Saturday voting days. And people have liked this. Uh, we only do it from 9 to 1, so you've got a little narrow margin on that Saturday, but do plan on those two Saturdays between October 13th and 30th. If you'd like to come to the courthouse and vote, we'll be open. So maybe you got through all these dates and it's November 3rd and you suddenly say, I didn't do anything about elections. We will have polling places open for you to come. You can look online and find your polling place. Um, you can call my office. You can uh, show up. Be sure you bring proof of your registration or proof of your residency. You need to have lived in Lake Hall County 30 days prior to election and be 18 years of age. So photo ID, proof of address, and thank you very much. I hope that answered most everybody's questions. If you still have questions, do call my office. And just so people know, if you requested your absentee ballot, we are going to be pushing about 8,000 of those out the door in the next week. Be watching for your ballot if you've already got it requested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry, and we really appreciate it. 
Now on to um, our, our luncheon today. So our, our luncheon looks quite different virtually um, with just our candidates in the room. Um, it's uh, quite different from what it normally and typically looks like, but uh, we want to provide this virtual platform um, as an educational process for not only our business community, but also the general public. So I am going to be introducing our moderator next. Um, Jamie Hill serves as the operations director for the Kenworthy Performing Arts Center, and she serves as chair as the Government Affairs Committee for the Moscow Chamber of Commerce. Please welcome Jamie. Hello, everybody. So wonderful to see people's faces. Hi. Uh, just a reminder that there are some rules in front of you. Um, so we'll be kind of going through some questions uh, one, at, uh, one at a time. Um, and if anybody online has some questions, we'd love you to drop them in the comments. We're keeping track. So uh, I will ask them as soon as possible. Um, so I would love to start with uh, Bill Thompson, prosecuting attorney. Um, Sarah, you've been in this role for quite a while, so first question up, what has been your greatest achievement in your role? I think the greatest achievement we've had is creating what I think many people will agree is one of the best prosecutor's offices in the state. We are recognized statewide, uh, and I hate to go on the horn, but really it's a team of it. It's not just me, although I'm the one who's been here for 28 years now. Um, my civil deputy is regularly invited to speak and instruct at the state and national level. Same with me. Um, we receive calls from other counties. In fact, we're serving as special prosecutors now. A shooting incident that happened in Idaho County back in July. Uh, I think that's a reflection on the integrity we have in our office and the experience. So thanks for the opportunity to tune on the point. Thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to add just to introduce yourself? I am Bill Thompson. I am the late top county prosecutor in Captain since 1992, so this is my 28th year. I've been an attorney here in Moscow for 40 years. In fact, I graduated from law school the day before Mount St. Helens blew up. So that was a big year. Passed the bar that year, got married that year, and my life has been wonderful ever since. <laughs> this is my home. I grew up as an Air Force brat, traveling all over the place, uh, and I never really had home. Uh, until I came here to Moscow and to Lake Talk County. And I've been here for 43 years now, never want to leave. Thank you, and thank you for your service. You're welcome. Uh, next up, we'll go to Sheriff Skiles. I'd love you to take a minute to introduce yourself before we ask you your first question. Okay. I'm Richie Skiles, Lake Talk County Sheriff. Um, been, this is going on my second term as Sheriff. I'm running unopposed, and I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> um, kind of makes things a little bit more simple. Um, Competition is good too, though. Um, anyway, um, we've had a good first four years, and I am appreciating the chance for the second four years. Thank you very much. Uh, first question for you Why does Lacehaw County need a new jail, and how will we afford one? That's a really good question. So, our jail was built in the early 70s, and it was adequate at that time for um, the residents of Lake Park County and the um, situation and the growth and stuff that we've had um, has been a lot over the last 50 years. And um, so I think that uh, we've got grown our jail. Our offices are really small now. We have a lot more employees than we used to. And when you have population growth, you have criminal growth. And so our jail has become inadequate. And so um, it's time that we consider that kind of um, I'm moving into a bigger jail, but it's going to be a while and it's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of effort from people. Okay, thank you. Um, we have had a couple notes from our online viewers already. They'd love it if everybody can lean into the mic a little more. I know we're really nice and hot in here, um, but if you could lean in a little bit better so our online viewers can better hear you. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, you all have movable mics too, so if you want to just cuddle up nice and close to them. That's a, a great trick. Um, so next up, I'd like to move on to the county commissioners. Uh, with us today, we have the current county commissioner from District 1, Kathy LaFortune, from District 2, Tom Lamar, and also running currently for District 2 is Gabriel Wrench. I'd like to start um, with Gabriel Wrench and have each of you take about two minutes to introduce yourself and kind of give your opening.
Kathy, go ahead. <laughs> Give it a minute. Hi, I'm Kathy LaFortune, and I'm running for Lake Tahoe County Commissioner. And though I'm running unopposed, as I told Jenny last night, I still lose a little bit of sleep before these forums because um, I can't take for granted uh, the support from this community that landed me in this position to begin with. And I wish maybe we'll, we'll touch the tip of the iceberg to talk about all that I've learned in the last one and three quarter years. Um, I've lived in Lake County now for 30 years, which means my daughter is just about to turn 30. I raised two active children here and I buried their father here. In uh, my career as a pediatric physical therapist, I've been to every corner of the county and um, provided services to children of all ages and in all different environments, schools, homes, playgrounds, grocery store parking lots, and most recent uh, service provision has been all virtual. Um, so I've been doing a lot of telehealth lately, which has its own elements of, of excitement and fun. Um, I get to see firsthand the struggles that a lot of our families see here, um, here encounter. I really call this place home. On the political spectrum, I'm a very fiscally conservative Democrat, and my, my uh, treasurer is a very socially liberal um, Republican, and I find we have a lot more in common than we have differences. Um, I have years of experience working with people, helping them solve problems, um, and I find that, you know, when you're solving a problem, it's best to to uh, not really have any preconceived plan. And I, I ran for this office to represent the people of Lake Tech County. That was my entire agenda, and it continues to be my agenda. I want every voice to be heard. Thank you. Thank you. And Tom Lamar. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, thanks, Jamie uh, Hill, for being our moderator. Um, I'd like to thank the Moscow Chamber of Commerce for holding this forum and the Best Western Plus University Inn and its employees for enabling us to, to be here today. Um, thank you also to Jess Dollinger for, uh, and the Lake Tahoe County Board of Realtors for sponsoring today's event. Um, I slept like a baby last night. And anybody who's been a parent knows how poor that might be sometimes. <laughs> uh, my name is Tom Lamar, and I'm honored to have served as your Lake Tahoe County Commissioner since being elected in 2014. I have chaired the commission uh, during the last three years after being chosen twice by two separate boards of commissioners. I've also worked as the executive director of the Blue's Clearwater Environmental Institute, BCEI, for the last 30 years. I grew up in Delaware in a very Republican household, understanding that being a fiscally being fiscally conservative includes included turning off the lights when not in use. My parents also took me on walks to the local nature center. To me, being conservative and being a conservationist was exactly the same thing. My next door neighbor was the veteran affairs director for Senator Biden. And when Joe came into the neighborhood, he would call me by my first name. Two years ago, I met again my childhood good humor man, uh, the ice cream deliverer, 40 years later at a National Association of Counties uh, meeting in Washington, D.C. He was the chair of the county councilman for Newcastle County, Delaware, and I was the chair of Lake Tahoe County Commissioners. I've been in Lake Tahoe County for 35 years now. After completing grad school at WSU, I started a family. My girls attended public school and graduated from the University of Idaho. My grandchildren live far away, and I live here because I'm dedicated to this place we call home. I want to make sure that Lake Tahoe County remains a great place to raise a family. Being a commissioner is a we job, not a me job. I love this big part of Team Lake Tahoe County and would love to return back to that job. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay, we're going to get into some fun questions. We had some pre-submitted um, for the commissioners specifically. So we're going to start with those. And again, if we have any coming in online, uh, I'll be adding those to the staff. So this one, we're going to start with Kathy, um, and then we'll go to Tom, and then to Gabe. So first question up, what role does the county play in helping communities rebuild post-COVID-19? And in addition to that, um, how, how do we do that and be fiscally responsible? Um, I think a big piece of that is advocating um, at the state level for some of the CARES monies and making sure that those are distributed fairly. I serve on 
the Chamber of Commerce boards. I serve on uh, partnership for economic prosperity board, and I also serve on uh, the CETA board. Um, and part of what we're we're doing is looking at monies that are coming in via grants. We also just recently hired a grant writer um, to help with receiving some of those monies. I'm also um, assisting uh, George Scandalous and his effort in Fair Idaho um, for the restaurants that are, are, I think our small restaurants and bars are going to be the ones hit most hard um, by this COVID um, pandemic because they're being asked to operate at 50% capacity and mostly outside. And so anything we can do to get restaurant owners and bar owners together, statewide to advocate for some funding to help them over this next hurdle is going to be important. There are a 50% capacity and mostly outside is very difficult for a restaurant when they have to operate at least 60% in order to break even. And now we're looking at the bad weather coming and I think this week has been a really big indication nobody wants to be outside with the smoke and I'm sure the restaurants and bars are very empty. So everything we can do to support those from an economic uh, prosperity or economic development uh, standpoint we will do and I'll, I'll, it will be one of my main focuses for our brand Thank you. Tom, same question. Um, we have um, we have been working on this issue from, since the very beginning of, of the pandemic um, response here in Lakeside County. Um, you know, in addition to standing up an emergency operations center and working closely um, three days a week with um, leaders of the city of Moscow, um, Britain Medical Center, University of Idaho, and um, the local public health district. Um, to figure out how to keep people safe, healthy, and alive. Um, we have also been working um, with our uh, various leaders of senior meal sites and um, other nonprofit organizations that are responding to specific needs that people have throughout the, um, the county, um, and working with businesses that um, have special needs, trying to figure out what might, how this might go for them. As we recover, um, we have been very active at Lakeside County in applying for grants to help with um, uh, the, you know, um, uh, on broadband online access for communities to try to improve access. And, and we will continue to look for those kinds of opportunities as we move forward. Um, and as Kathy says, there are uh, lots of different specific issues that are facing specific businesses. And Blaytock County will continue to advocate on behalf of those businesses through the various appointments that we have, Police Knowledge Corridor, Moscow Chamber of Commerce. Um, and actually, even though we're in the Pullman Chamber of Commerce, there's a lot of um, networking that's happening across across borders. So lots, lots more to come on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first off, um, I think it's important to be principled in how we make decisions in the first place. We, um, the government does not have the authority to shut down businesses, period. No constitutional authority, it's not in the Constitution, so I think we need to be principled in how we approach these pandemics in the first place, and we aren't. <laughs> Second, the current um, commissioners have raised taxes four years in a row, so not only do we shut down our businesses, but then the, the taxation problem is creating the issue of businesses being able to recover faster. Uh, lastly, as a leader, as leaders of our county, uh, we need principal leadership that our communities and our businesses can see and understand and know what predictability is guiding our decisions. We've pulled the rug out from under, our, under their feet, starting on the March 25th resolution with the Moscow City Mayor of Moscow, and then also our governor uh, made a resolution that same day, shutting down businesses. And then both the commissioner answers here today um, include basically asking the government for more help, more grant money, and so forth. And so we're, the government shuts us down, and then we look to the government to ask for more help, more money. Uh, that I, I think the issue is actually getting the government out of the way and letting our businesses make their own decisions to be able to protect their own clients, their own health uh, in their communities and in their businesses. That's um, kind of what it means to be conservative and what it has been for a long time, and we kind of fooled those definitions. So I'd like to get back to principal conservative um, uh, leadership and decisions on how we approach these issues, which um, actually, incidentally, uh, give businesses the predictability to be able to get back to business. Thank you. Thank you all. 
Our next question is another broad lay talk family question, and this time we're going to start with Tom, <clears throat> and then go to Dave, and then to Kathy. Tom, what will you do to help protect Laytown County against the effects of climate change? <laughs> well, um, I do it every day when I ride my bike to work. Um, mo most of those um, opportunities that we have are individual opportunities, um, and oftentimes governments have an ability to um, help people be able to make their decisions. Um, the city of Moscow, for example, has um, enacted, well, they've got the, the um, uh, citizen committee that works a lot on environmental recommendations for the city of Moscow, looking at how the city does work with um, its energy um, consumption. And um, another issue is how cities and counties um, zone and develop their communities so that it makes it easier for people to make good decisions to um, reduce their impact. The fact that we've got a bus um, locally helps people. Um, the fact that um, people can easily get around walking or biking, um, it's hot from the smoke, but uh, people are able to get around and it, and it, does, it does help with those personal decisions. Um, from a policy perspective, um, we need to um, make sure that we're considering climate change and all of the um, decisions that we make. We can't um, do it on our own. Uh, Laytai County is one county of 3,000 in the United States, and the United States is one country out of many in the world. Um, but we do uh, see throughout the United States that local governments are the leaders on climate change issues. Um, one of the things we can do from a county perspective is to make sure that we've got, um, you know, going after solar panel opportunities or other ways of, of diversifying our energy consumption. When I was in school studying science, 300 parts per million was the um, standard for carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere. It's now over 400. That's unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, so my view that climate change is cyclical and not man man driven, and I think there's a lot of debate to be had on that. But I really, um, I mean, look at the historical trends and climate change is largely cyclical. Uh, and a lot of the um, solutions that have been put forth have actually um, been really problematic and not even that helpful. So um, Tom mentioned solar panels and uh, a lot of the other solutions are around you know, what, wind turbine electricity and so forth. They are very inefficient in how they produce electricity. Um, for wind turbine, it's about 14 cents to 18 cents per kilowatt to produce electricity in comparison to hydro, which is about 8 cents um, per kilowatt to produce electricity. And then wind turbines produce the best, the best production of electricity is about 3 a.m. in the morning when no one needs electricity. That's when the wind patterns are the best. Uh, secondly, and this is why California is actually going through rolling blackouts right now, is because they poured all their money in this renewable energy that's not healthy and it's not a good solution. So a lot of our solutions around this are actually not not good. Uh, you can look at um, uh, you know um, uh, hybrid cars, the hybrid car technology. It actually costs um, more carbon emissions to produce a hybrid car and all the way through recycling, recycling batteries, recycling acid, recycling the batteries that um, these cars are um, utilizing actually produces more carbon output through the whole process than a Hummer. Um, no one wants to no one wants to uh, talk about that, but that's the reality of what goes on, especially from all the mine and mineral stripping that it takes for these batteries. So I think the government's role should largely, largely be polling and not pushing all this. So what I mean by polling is that the government should be meeting with community leaders and talking about solutions that the private business can and, and men and women who own their own property should be paid for it, and the government should be polling with solutions, not pushing. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, there it goes. Um, you know, there, there are the small solutions that we can do, such as uh, we just approved a, a window um, project at the courthouse because the windows that were installed there, I don't know, way before my time there for sure. Um, are very energy inefficient and they're having and we lose a lot of energy there so 
our building and grounds person has been working um, to upgrade heating, you know, the HVAC system not only to screen out virus, but also to make sure that it's more efficient. And I think the windows will help a lot as far as just reducing energy usage over the winter. Um, I think that, you know, climate change, especially in our area, we have some of the cheapest energy in the country, and it's because we have a really good um, hydro portfolio um, combined with some wind and also some big solar up in the up in the sort of northeast corner of, of um, Washington. And so I think continuing that cooperation between um, not only two counties, but two states um, in our general area to really look at the hydro in cooperation with some of um, some of the other uh, renewable sources. Idaho is one of the few states that does not have a re renewable uh, portfolio. There's nothing from the state saying we leave out to, to try to go mostly renewable energy by such and such a date. There's nothing, so there's very little incentive for um, for some of these renewable companies to locate in Idaho, and I'd like to see that change. Um, so encouraging that. Um, the other thing, and this is sort of a, a put on my other hat as providing a lot of telehealth, um, the main column in my invoices for the work that I've been doing for for uh, Driven lately through uh, telehealth is the column on that invoice called travel has completely disappeared. Um, and so I don't see the world of telehealth going backwards. I see it where it's going to be part of our, our foreseeable future. And um, we have to get going on the broadband stuff so that everybody in Lake County has equal access to their telehealth services. I've got a nice and quick question. I'm going to start with Gabe this time. So our current sitting commissioners have a minute to do some math. Uh, easy question. How many county commission meetings have you attended? Zero. Thank you. Kathy? Um, two times, you know, probably 50. So hundreds, I mean, and each meeting, some of them, like some mornings we have six different meetings within the course of the morning and then another three in the afternoon. So I can't even do the math there. So all of those commission meetings since I was sworn in on, on January 14th, I also attended probably a hundred commissioner meetings before I was elected because coming from healthcare and then going into um, county government was a, a pretty big leap. And I wanted to make sure that I knew what I was getting myself into. Um, and also to feel like I was um, informed enough to come to forums and answer questions. So yeah, that was part of it. Thank you, Tom. As a commissioner, I've been attending commissioner meetings um, either in person or recently uh, online um, for almost six years now, um, two times a week um, or more. And um, before I became a commissioner, I spent a lot of time going to county commissioner meetings to learn how the budget process worked. Um, about seven months or eight months before being elected, and then before that, just as a city council member for Moscow, going to county commissioner meetings just to connect between governments. Um, so I don't know how many of that is, but I could probably start uh, working on the map if you really want to know how to answer to that. I think that I think that'll answer her question. Thank you. Um, the next question we're going to go in the same order. Uh, we're going to start with Gabe, and we're actually going to end with Sheriff Styles for a little bit of a follow up to the question, if that's okay. So this question just came in from our online audience: Do you support a drug dog for the sheriff's office? Yeah, I think um, I think I would. Um, I know there's um, different kinds of drug dogs, four sniff drug dogs, three sniff drug, drug dogs. Um, I think that um, uh, is an important part of the conversation. Um, I, I mean, I s support our sheriff's office and I support our um, deputies. And I think um, drug dogs could potentially be helpful um, to our community with the drug dogs that we have in our rural, especially in the rural community. So, yeah. I'm open for, I'm very open to that discussion. I think I'm on. Okay, I, I've yet to meet a dog that I don't like, and I'm sure I would like to share a uh, drug dog as well. As you know, that it's been on the budget now for the last, or in the budget request, I should say, for the last three 
budget cycles. And um, you know, very typical in our budget cycle is, is we get sort of the this is what we this is what we need to do our work, this is what we want, and then we have to go back to the drawing board and say, well, we can afford this, but we can't afford that. And Unfortunately, for the last few years, uh, Sheriff's Director Ark has been the thing that, you know, when it comes down to um, vehicles that aren't going to break down on the highway for our deputies versus having a direct dog, uh, the vehicles have always fallen off. Um, I think that this is one of the things that our grant writers can begin to work on because it's, it's, it's expensive, you know, and, and we're doing everything we can to make sure that we keep cost down as much as we possibly can and um, we're talking about thirty thousand dollars for the dog and training and, and it just is you know that's you can get a part for that. So um, I'd like to see I'd like to see one. Um, I think it would be effective. I think that there's a lot of concern that there's gonna be a, a, a dog out roaming in the community that's just gonna pick up drugs in that snap so a, a drug dog so it's 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 part of a a much more structured program than that. They're not going to be picking people up in the city park because they saw something. So, just so people understand that. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, I'm very supportive of the sheriff's office having access to being able to use a drug dog. Um, and, and we've been able to have that um, with cooperation between law enforcement agencies. So I'm, I'm, I think it's great when they have that tool to use for um, for their law enforcement purposes. Um, with respect to purchasing a drug dog, as um, Commissioner Fortune's pointed out, um, we've had that request for us for the last two years. And um, because of um, being the fiscal conservatives, Commissioners that we are, we've had to limit access to those funds and said no. Um, it's a thirty thousand dollar request. Um, that's about three quarters of a police vehicle, um, probably a hundred percent of another vehicle. But um, you know, I if we were to have a full time drug dog that we owned, I would prefer a three sniff to a four sniff, um, which is basically the number of uh, drugs that they are trained to pick up, um, simply because with Washington State being across the border, it makes more sense to not trigger unnecessary um, uh, pickups, and who can't smell marijuana anyway? I mean, it's not really that necessary. I'm more interested in, in going after the drugs that are the major um, crisis problems that, we, that do exist in Montauk County, the opioids, heroin, and cocaine are the ones that we really need to be protected. So um, from, a, from a financial perspective, it hasn't made sense yet because the Sheriff's Office has let us know that it's, uh, paying good salaries and purchasing adequate vehicles are two choices that fall in above the dollar cycle. Okay. Thank you. Insurance Scouts, what do you have to add to that conversation? I've, uh, we have put in the request for the dog uh, in the last three years. Um, the county commissioners, I feel, have uh, worked with me really hard on getting a lot of the requests that I've asked for, other than the dog. And um, they're right. We've um, had to upgrade our vehicle situation and employees, benefits, and things like that definitely come first. I think uh, this year I put in for a three cent dog, and instead of a four cent dog, and I think the would have COVID just got passed actually if um, it wouldn't have been for the COVID stuff and everything kind of set, set us back a little bit. So I'm going to put in for it next year and they probably expect that. And if we don't have any um, terrible outbreaks of whatever, um, et cetera, I think that I have a really good chance of, I just really felt that this time that the, the canine was um, something that we would have probably got if we were not so there's a lot of unexpected expenses and stuff that could have came up or did come up from the COVID thing. And so um, I very much um, accepted the fact that we probably wouldn't get a dog this time, but we did get other things that we needed that were probably just as important or more important. Next year, I'll put in a request for a three cent dog, and I don't think that I'm going to get my proposition from them, but we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, this next question, we're going to go backwards, moving from Tom to Kathy to Gabe. <clears throat> How can Lakeside County work with the state of Idaho to get more funding for our county? 
That's a very general question. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. You know, I'm not sure if it's funding from the state that would be helpful as it is. Um, what do we need to do to get the state to um, help improve the property tax situation for the people that live here? Um, I would really like the state of Idaho to um, improve the circuit breaker eligibility levels. I would like the state of Idaho to um, index our um, homeowners exemption so that people pay a more fair, um, have a more fair deduction for owning a home. Um, I would like the state of Idaho to better fund schools within the state of Idaho as is constitutionally mandated. That would take a lot of pressure off of property taxes. Um, voters all over Lake County and the state of Idaho um, really need to get behind property tax levies in order to fund um, schools adequately because the state fails to do that. So um, those are the, the pieces that would be very helpful um, right off the bat that would, that would help a lot. I think the state of Idaho also needs to go back and look at um, its tax exemptions or tax reductions they did in 2018 to match up with federal tax laws. And um, I think that would help provide them the money that they need for better fund schools. So that's a, those are some large um, um, issues that I think the state could do to better assist property taxpayers in Lake County and the other 43 counties of Idaho. Um, and then, you know, we can continue to look at whatever funding requests might be available um, with the state. Um, but there are other um, funding opportunities too, besides just the state of Idaho. And that's why I'm excited about our campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. I don't know that I can add a whole lot to what Tom said. He's got the basic picture right. I think I think another thing that I would like to see the state do is right now we have all these different levy caps. And so like the justice has a levy cap. And so all these different funds have different caps. We have certain ways that we can so even though our, our state government likes to say, you know, we believe in local control, except for we don't want to give the counties and the cities a whole lot of control. We want to maintain control over how they spend their money. So I would like to see a little bit more, you know, Idaho is a very diverse state and we have a lot of different needs throughout the state depending on where we live. And um, I, I wish there was a little bit better trust and cooperation between the state government and the local governments regarding, okay, you know, here's your, your revenue share of sales tax, as a tax, you know, all of those types of things. Giving us a little bit more freedom to say this is where we feel that this money could be better spent. Um, we are seeing, you know, a reduction in the cost for inpatient medical claims due to Medicaid expansion. That's been, that's been great. Um, but we all agree that we don't want to see that money completely dry up because there are so many other um, indigent needs within our area. We're one of the most food insecure counties. Um, in the state of Idaho, and we also have an affordable housing problem here. And so, if we were able to utilize some of that money, not maybe in medical, but for, for addressing those two problems, I think that would be really, really beneficial. Thank you. Yeah, a, a government's job should be limited and defined well. And part of what's happened in all this is that um, the government wants to try to do a little bit of everything. So that increases government budgets, that increases government overreach. And then, uh, we've reached the point right now where um, the more government, the more taxation that our uh, government um, puts on us, requires from us, the less the, our liberties go down, um, our liberties decline. And that's the point of where our government is at. Uh, when we, um, you know, uh, looking for funding from the state just means that more things come with it. Uh, we, we need to actually, I think this is kind of a long-term legislative uh, solution here. But what I'd like to see is actually the counties and cities keep most of their money and then send a small percentage of that up to the state to be able to operate this, the required needed state functions, limited state functions. Instead of um, funding a Department of Education in the state of Idaho, which requires, you know, Greg Bailey to, you know, you've got to hire this teacher, you've got to hire this staff. It's, very daily do all these decisions that are not connected to the local decision process that we need to be making on behalf of our public schools. And so um, 
different when we look to the state for more funding. All we're doing is looking for more strains, more regulation, and actually increases costs over time. Um, to uh, Tom, Tom Lamar brought up a more, you know, more fair tax deduction for our properties. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm for that in some sense, but I wouldn't be raising our taxes four years in a row and then look to the state to try to fix some sort of tax deduction fairness game uh, that needs to happen locally. So I, I think we've kind of created a governmental entangled mess between state and local municipalities and local counties that I think um, kind of needs to be sorted out. Uh, and in the end, um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the taxpayers would have a freer, um, freer way to, to see their local money used efficiently in local government. Thank you. Next question for the three of you, we'll start with Dave, then go to Kathy, and then to Tom. What will you do specifically to protect public lands in Lake Tahoe County? Dave, you're up first. Yeah, thank you. Um, Again, I think uh, the county government should have uh, limited lands. I don't know about the county government having buildings and so forth. Um, I think uh, public lands, uh, for the most part, are kind of outside the purview of, of the government. Um, when you look at a lot of the wildfires that are being stuck, that were started in California, Washington, Oregon, and even happens in Idaho, it happens on public lands because public lands, the more lands we have, it's harder for us to manage. And so, um, I think what we want to do is we want to keep the government um, limited and focused on their duties of serving their citizens instead of spread out and creating all these um, problems by, by taking care of more property than they can actually take care of. So, um, uh, yeah, I think I think um, the public land issue, we need to be faithful of what we do have and what we do own. And so uh, that would be where I, I land on that. Um, for one thing, Lake County doesn't have a tremendous amount of, of public land. Most of our most of our land, especially around Moscow, is, is privately owned. I don't know how many people are aware of this, but Moscow Mountain, for example, it's 99.5% private private ownership. Um, most of our big swaths of open forest land are owned by um, three very large timber companies within um, that that cross borders into other counties as well. Um, as far as access to open space, and I think maybe that's what people are referring to. Um, you know, Laytock County, the, the planning and building departments work very hard to maintain the open agricultural and open uh, timber type of land that we have in Laytock County. And they've done a lot of that through the planning and zoning commissions, working to concentrate development in smaller developed areas when they're out in the rural parts of the world. In other words, if a a farmer needs to sell off, you know, some of his agricultural land in order to set his 401k. That's how that's how he's going to retire. Um, instead of instead of cutting it up into you know 80 acre parcels, they may cut it. You know, he may have four land be eligible for four land divisions. And what they'll do is they'll say, okay, let's take you know these four or five uh, different smaller plots right along an already existing road, right next to existing infrastructure. Give him the building permits on those five lots as opposed to cutting it up into big rectangles and city fences everywhere. Um, maintaining the open nature, concentrating development where development already occurs, and then maintaining the open um, nature of both our agriculture and forest lands is, is part of the planning and zoning process. And sometime in my tenure here, I think we'll be re looking at that comprehensive plan. Um, and I look forward to doing that. I also want to take into account. Um, what we're seeing with small, uh, small based agriculture pop, popping up all over the county. Um, some of these small CSAs and small hobby farms, we need to be looking at how we fund for those. Thank you. Um, so, public lands within a local county include uh, there's some city ownership, there's some county ownership, there's some state ownership, and there's some federal ownership of public lands. Um, and as Commissioner Burton points out, the percentages within Lake Tech County is pretty moderate compared to other counties in the state of Idaho, such as Idaho County, which is federal. Um, as a county commissioner, we, but, but as also Commissioner Burton pointed out, we have tremendous opportunities to work with private landowners that are very generous in the willingness to let people access their land. Um, for example, Moscow Mountain, the whole Mamba um, network of trails, 
and there are people that we work with on um, Paradise Ridge, which have uh, a, a very generously allowed people to come and access those lands and interact. And, and there are many other places around. Um, a county commissioner does have a lot of um, statewide uh, responsibilities and regionwide responsibilities with respect to public lands and other issues having to do um, uh, within within Idaho um, issues. Um, I have been appointed by Secretary Purdue to sit on the U.S. Forest Service Rock Committee and we have um, funding decisions to help with projects within the North Central Idaho area um, that will help to improve those public lands, that will help reduce fire damage uh, or danger, um, help the, uh, improve water quality. So there's a lot of things that we can do to help make those places um, better when we go and have those experiences on that land and make them more resource um, uh, friendly and more resource productive. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this next question, we're going to start with Kathy, then Tom, and then end with David. What will you do to strengthen public schools at Mount Saint Tom County? That's a state legislature question, and I think I think we've, we touched on that. I would love to see um, the state adequately fund education in the state. We're really far down there, and yet there's very little as a county commissioner that we can do. Right now, our schools are being run on supplemental levies pretty much throughout, certainly throughout, the, throughout this county. Um, our communities believe in education, so usually it's pretty fairly easy to pass a, an operational type of levy. It's much more difficult to pass the superintendent needed for any kind of um, instruction. Our youngest public school in the state in, in the city of Moscow is 50 years old. It just turned 50 years old. And that's that's just um, a crime. And when I think about you know everything that they've had to do to get these buildings safe, to bring students back into them, um, you know, you can only do so much with ventilation systems, HF systems that are that are over 50 years old. So um, we need to do something about the facilities problem. Um, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that we're not where my daughter's family is right now, where they're running on a four-day school week that starts in, uh, you know, after Labor Day or the outside early May. I'm glad that we've not done more than that for students, but we're doing so on the back of our tax credit. Um, yeah, the, the large responsibility is with the state for funding of, of public schools within Lake County. Um, but we also function um, as cooperators um, with our school districts. We have five rural school districts in the city of Moscow and then the city of Moscow school district. Um, we uh, help in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of the ways that we help is we have a, um, a a school resource officer that can go and attend um, schools and be there and be available and, and help and identify what issues might be happening socially with kids that might lead to um, you know, maybe either mental health issues or crime issues or so forth. And, and so the county plays a, a, a you know, team role there. Um, yesterday, um, the Potlatch School District announced, and today the White Pine School District announced that they've been accepted for uh, waivers to um, help provide um, breakfast and uh, lunch programs for all kids in the school district, which is tremendous, especially given the situation right now um, where kids maybe not having access to meals. So there's two meals out of three that they, will, they have access to in those two school districts. So, you know, there's there are ways that we as commissioners or as the county can help to improve communication and, and make connections between different, you know, between different organizations. Um, helping them move towards speaking with the public health district to um, make sure that they're taking all the measures they need um, to take with respect to COVID has been another area that we can work in the school districts. Thanks. Yes, as Tom and Kathy pointed out, many commissioners and the responsibility of the public school system is, is limited. Um, and the influence there is, um, you know, the oversight there is pretty much non existent. It really is a legislator 
issue. And I actually think that that's the hard part, one of our um, education problems is that we drastically criticize our public school systems. Um, and it's all caught up in Boise and not, we don't have very little local control of our systems. Like Bailey has to report to the Department of Education and we have to set our standards based on what the state tells us to do. We have to hire teachers based on what the state says. You know, we have to, you know, do our curriculum based on largely what the state says. We have very little local control of our public school systems and which is drastically criticized the process and made it really hard. So it's kind of a measure how to fight to the nail for Lake Bailey to get more authority over who is our, our public school systems and keep the control local and in the hands of the parents. Because that's essentially education is a parental responsibility, not a state responsibility. Thank you. Our next question um, is a pretty big topic. It's been in conversation for quite a while. I know the Government Affairs Committee for the Moscow Committee of Commerce has talked about this a lot, both at the local level and at the state level. So starting with Dave, as it is Kathy and Tom, what is your solution for the property tax issue that we're talking about? Kathy, you well, since I get to go first, um, a, a, a couple things. Um, one is, actually, I think our, our, our property taxes, that structure, that systemic structure, is, is um, not healthy. Um, to, for the government to be able to um, tell you that you own your house when you really don't because of property taxes, and that you have to pay property taxes, and if you don't, we'll take your house back. That's not really true um, home ownership. And so I would actually, um, long term, of course, this is another legislative issue, uh, but long term, I'd like to restructure how we um, pay taxes. I think tax is a legitimate function. I think the government is um, to be paid, to be collecting taxes. I think that's all legitimate. I just don't like it being tied to our property. We don't own our property if the government can take your property away if you don't pay taxes. It's just an um, upside down process. So I think that's a that's a really kind of like a 20, 30 year um, vision is actually retool how we do taxes and to do property taxes. So I love our our state to be one of the, you know, to be a, a, a state that does not have property taxes but flood taxes, I think, for more um, normal and regular uh, and logical uh, means than property taxes. So with that said, um, I, I'm absolutely opposed to raising our property taxes given the, the, the um, we are the second highest tax county, property tax county in Idaho, Lake Tahoe County is. And our commissioners have voted four years in a row to increase by 3% our taxes every year. Uh, so I think um, we need real conservative principle leadership, particularly on this issue, because the more um, tax money, the more government money is collected, the less freedoms you have, the less choice you have with your own money. And we're building a long-term problem if we don't deal with this tax issue. Thank you. Okay, um, property tax issue. Things that we can, that we can do, because I don't think they're going to go away, at least not during the time that I'm, that I'm the commissioner. Um, I think the first thing that we need to do is, is re-index the homeless exemption. I don't remember the exact dates, but it's been certainly within my time at Lake County, probably within the last decade, they, they stopped saying half of your property value and, and capped it at a hundred thousand. And so, um, I don't know of too many homes within the city limits of Moscow that are under $200,000 right now. And so being able to index that homeowner's exemption so that, so that businesses and agricultural and timber and everybody else in the county is paying their fair share right now, the, the burden is predominantly on the homeowner. And I'd like to see that shift to something more equitable. Um, the other thing I would like to see is the circuit breaker has been capped and this is for our um, as we so affectionately call her, the little old lady out in Bowville, um, who's living on a fixed income. Um, she has not been able to apply for and qualify for the home nurse exemption um, based on her, um, her current income. And I want to see that, that index up so that um, more of our, our citizens can take advantage of a property tax relief. Um, the other thing we need to do is look statewide at tax exemptions. Um, right now, our county functions on a budget that's about half of what Nez Perce County functions on. And the reason being is that we have a ton of tax exempt properties here in Lake County. We've got the university, we've got the hospital, 
Um, we have a lot of churches, and um, we need to be really looking at um, those tax exemptions, and I'd love to see some sort of trade all reform there. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is start looking at affordable housing, and, and, and we've talked about this before. You know, if we can get some of those houses built that are under $200,000, that's going to help, um, especially first time homeowners, homeowners a lot, or people that are on a first time home. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Well, thank you. Um, just to set the record straight, um, Motel County isn't the second highest um, property tax um, assessment county in the state of Idaho. According to the 2019 Idaho Property Tax Report, which is the latest report, um, it's 70 pages long, produced by the Associated Taxpayers of Idaho. Lake Tuck County, of course, is um, we have a population of about 40,000 people. That's similar to what West Coast County has. It's we're 10th in population. Um, the um, Lake County property tax per person is $263. We come in 38th place out of 44. And our, Le our Lake County levy rate is 0 0.406, 1758 which is 23rd place. Um, that just got reduced this past year, so next year it's 0.3. Um, we can compare that to Nez Perce County. Um, it's got a similar population. Um, it's ninth place, 40,000 plus people. Um, the Nez Perce County property tax per person is $432 per person. That's in the 14th place, and the Nez Perce County levy rate is 0.5. Zero, which is seven place. So these numbers demonstrate that the Lake Tahoe County Commissioners have a history of being fiscally conservative and excellently managing their budgets. Um, it's not correct to say that we're somehow um, abusing the taxpayers um, and, and over excessively taxing. I, I outlined earlier what the state of Idaho needs to do, um, and we regularly see values in Lake Tahoe County increase, and that affects taxes. But people want to move here and they want to live here, and assessment is based on market values. Um, we are required to make sure that we're taxing based on this assessment. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, so I'm talking about median property taxes. I'm not talking about per person or levies or per, cap, per person taxes. We're the second highest property, um, median property taxes in Idaho. Um, that's what I'm referring to, and that is, that is um, the data. Thank you for that clarification. Would any of the commissioners like to respond? Yeah, I would. Um, I'd love to see the source of that data. I don't believe that's good. And um, I, I think that, you know, we have 39 taxing districts within this, within one town. County. The three commissioners are in charge of the tax rates for one of those 39 tax districts, the Lake County. And it's not really uh, appropriate to try to pin property taxes that are assessed by a city, a fire district, um, a highway district, a school district, or any other taxing district. So if the, the data are generated from trying to add something up, um, I, I think it's really important to understand what the job is in the way that I'm sure. Thanks. And for our rules, are going to be happy to know if you to respond as well. Okay. We will. Huh? Okay. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. Uh, something that was mentioned is that people want to move to Moscow. Uh, the state of Idaho, as well as chambers of commerce across the state, have really been focused lately on intrastate transportation. And keeping in mind that the Chamber of Commerce serves as a visitor center and a center for tourism, um, one of accessibility to the area is a priority for the diverse population of both our residents and our visitors. So as a county commissioner, what would you do to support the Moscow permit effort? Uh, let's start with Kathy. Well, we, we support it every single year financially with a fair chunk of change um, as, as part of our partnership with them. This year, 
um, due to the COVID pandemic. One of the reasons we were able to pass the zero percent increase on our on our budget this year was because of um, some of our partners, such as Partnership for Economic Prosperity, did not ask for twenty degrees this year, and the airports did not ask for twenty degrees. Um, I don't serve on the airport commission, so there's not a lot that I can do as an individual, but just to know that we do kind of support them financially every single year. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks so much. Um, we have an excellent representative uh, from Waitai County on the airport board that's called Emma, and he's been terrific at representing Waitai County over the years. Um, I've been very supportive of the airport expansion um, starting back when I was a city council member. Um, we definitely um, worked hard to get enough money to help access federal dollars, and it was terrific that we were able to negotiate a very favorable um, local match rate. Um, there was a difference in the match rate between the state of Idaho and Washington, and we were able to uh, come in between us um, uh, in negotiating with with the FAA and uh, with the help of our elected officials on both sides of the border, both blue and red. Um, we have seen a really terrific development of the airport, and um, last year we all sat on the tarmac um, while we were um, dedicating it, and it was, uh, it, was a, it was a great experience. Um, unfortunately, of course, COVID hit, and now we don't have um, a great uh, opportunity to take advantage of the airport. But, um, Again, um, there was a terrific grant that was received um, by airport leadership that is allowing uh, us to look at future um, routes potentially to Denver and potentially also attracting other airlines. So when we get back to that place of being able to um, use the airport and airlines like we have, we have a real good opportunity. The next steps, of course, are um, improving the terminal, um, and uh, probably Whitman County commissioners are going to need to be looking at um, making sure the road is going to work well for access to the airport for trucks and, and, and you know, regular residential users. Thanks so much. Uh, Lewiston Airport should merge with our airport. Definitely. No, just kidding. Start the fire there. Um, uh, so uh, there's a couple issues there. One, one of the things that is happening here is we've gotten used to the rock in our shoe. In other words, you kind of walk down the street, you get a rock in your shoe, and then after, over time you forget about the rock, even though it's still causing some, uh, maybe some frustration. Um, uh, I have a number of uh, friends who are in the business, pilots, etc., uh, and the regulation is actually absolutely killing the capacity for big airlines to come into our local. Um, airports. Um, all the regulations that they have to go through uh, is is um, makes the cost efficiency really difficult to be able to work the numbers on. So that's why we have to we have to seek grants and so forth to be able to incentivize airlines to come into our community because there's issues. Secondly, um, t I mean uh, all the money that goes into TSA, we have a local TSA here. Why like, why do we have a TSA security in our, in our local airports? We've just gotten so used to that since two, um, since nine eleven happened. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, and, and we, we, we aren't thinking about some of the regulations that are making it really difficult, that are significantly increasing costs and travel and so forth. So, uh, and, then, and then lastly, uh, this kind of comes back to uh, some of the basic principles that we should be living by, that we used to live by, is the government doesn't have the right to shut down the business, and that's caused a massive problem for the airline industry. And so now, we, um, you know, the airline industry is looking to the government to bail them out again. But you know, the government causes the problem. The government shuts everything down, and then the, air, you know, then the government becomes the solution. Uh, and that just it, it does not make sense at all. Thank you. I have one more question for the three commissioners, then we'll jump back to the gentleman on the end for a minute. Uh, <clears throat> let's start this one um, with Tom, with Dave, and then to Kathy. What will you do to help strengthen health care for working families in the South Carolina? Thanks. Um, well, I started doing that um, six years ago when I've been lobbying heavily in the state of Idaho to expand Medicaid. Um, it was, it put a flat spot on my forehead, banging my head against the wall down in Boise for so many years. But um, luckily, the citizens of Idaho took over that responsibility. 
and um, passed Medicaid expansion last year, uh, two years ago, and it was a terrific opportunity for the people of Idaho. We now have more than 70,000 newly insured people um, in the state that um, helps to um, provide access for the people of Idaho. Um, it's huge for what that's done for Lake Tech County. Um, we have seen a, a relaxing of um, the needs for indigent funds, and I think over time that's going to um, help us um, be able to use those funds other ways or, or reduce taxes that way. So there's a, there's a variety of things that can help people because of Medicaid expansion. Um, I've also, uh, because of the high suicide rate within um, North Central Idaho, I sit as the vice chair for the Behavioral Health Board for a region and um, work very closely with many other people in the region to uh, do a number of things. We started a recovery center. Um, last year, we started the Rural Crisis Center Network, which is a terrific model for helping to provide um, a location in multiple communities throughout our region where people who are going through a mental health crisis can go and get help rather than depending on the sheriff's office or the police department to bring them in. And so there are a lot of things that we need to do more. Um, and I'm uh, out of time. There's a lot that I've been doing, so thank you. Yeah, this is a, um, a, a really important topic. Um, Part of the problem is that since the government's been significantly involved in healthcare since the 1960s, costs have skyrocketed. So government regulation and government price controls actually increased our healthcare and our health insurance. And so that, uh, again, when you look to the government, it actually increases the problem. Uh, secondly, there's actually a number of new um, uh, health insurance, health sharing models out there that are really innovative and really fantastic. And uh, so I think the government needs to kind of um, allow for those to expand uh, those health sharing um, groups and, and organizations. And basically, what those groups do is if you're a community of people who put money into a fund, and then that money is shared for health insurance purposes um, throughout the people who are participating in that co op. And it's fantastic. I've been driven down my health care costs. I'm an independent contractor. If, um, when I uh, moved companies, uh, and became an independent contractor, uh, traditional health insurance was going to be $5,000 a deductible, about $1,200 a month on health share um, uh, that, I, that I work with, um, drove the deductible, still about $5,000, but then my health costs are about $300 a month back then. So it just drove everything way down, and the coverage is way better. So we've, we've kind of gotten into this traditional role where we expect the government to be so such a part of our health care when it's actually caused far more problems than it's solved. And, and that's what it really needs to be concerned with is put the decisions back into the families and really put the decisions back into people who are um, actually making the decisions, their healthcare decisions. And from hospitals, this is one of the few industries where you go and get a heart surgery, you go get a, have a, a, a need, and then you find out the cost afterwards. Um, and that's because the government regulates it and allows the hospitals to hide everything. So we really need to change that process. I'm actually going to agree with Dave, and that I think there needs to be greater transparency of costs for healthcare. And, and one of the practices that I do personally is anytime I'm going to see a doctor for a recommended test, I want to know up front how much it's going to cost. And they'll often say, well, your insurance company will pay for that. And I know that, but I also want to know exactly what it's going to cost. And I think that we do need to have greater transparency of healthcare costs. I think there's this um, confusion, being a healthcare worker, there's healthcare coverage and then there's healthcare costs, and they're two different issues, and they're both out of control um, in this country, and I'm not sure what the exact perfect solution is, but I do know that I feel an obligation to make sure that we're taking care of our most vulnerable citizens, and those would be our elderly, our children, and our disabled populations. And um, some of the plans that Dave is talking about break down when you talk about the, the cost of the care for one of the, even one of those individuals that have special needs. Um, I will do what I can as a county commissioner at this point to continue to support the recovery center and crisis centers. I think that's going to decrease our, our, our mental health care costs dramatically if we, can, if we can get on top of those things. And affordable housing is right in there with um, with that population. Um, the other thing, and I alluded to this earlier in the forum, is just um, 
equal access to our county for telehealth services. It's going to really reduce costs. Um, it's um, something that a lot of our remote uh, citizens could take advantage of, um, but we have got to get broadband out to those areas so that they can take advantage of it. So broadband ties in with health care. Uh, the second to last question I'd like to ask, I already asked this of Bill Thompson, but I'd like to go back to um, Sheriff Skiles and then to our incumbent uh, commissioners. Sheriff Skiles, what has been your greatest achievement in, as, in your role as the sheriff? There's been quite a few things we've done. Can you, can you speak to that? Excuse me. There's been quite a few things we've done. Um, we, as a team up there, I have a, I think just bringing people together um, as a team and working hard for the county, um, for the people, that has been really a great accomplishment. I get um, emails and text messages on a regular basis about how well they were treated by a deputy or whatever um, on a call, and that kind of stuff just makes me feel really good. Um, we know we're doing the right thing up there. We have a great team that's working hard to make sure we're doing the right things. We um, added a permanent school resource deputy after I took office. We added a permanent drug task force deputy at their first office. Um, Chief Fry and I um, have a really well working relationship together. We consolidated our tech teams together to help save time and money and on training. Um, so those kind of things, I think there's no one big thing we've done. We've just done a lot of um, a lot of smaller things that have made all of this a bigger thing to make it a better place for the citizens and for the employees. And uh, we've worked really hard at building relationships with surrounding agencies, um, with everybody that um, I work with, like commissioners coming in, um, everybody, um, Bill Thompson's office. I feel like we all have a really good working relationship. I have a, working, a really good work relationship with the paper um, and BTV. We, we just, uh, things have come a long way in the last. Um, three and a half, four years, and I just appreciate all of that. So that's kind of what I would say as far as a bigger accomplishment. Thank you. Tell me why. What's been your greatest achievement as a county commissioner? Well, um, I, I would say, and it's one that, that we're very proud of, and it's hard for me to say we, because it's a we. As I said earlier, the Board of County Commissioners is a three member board, and uh, the last two boards. Um, with Dick, Dave, and Tom, and now with Kathy, Dave, and Tom, um, I would say that we have worked very hard to make sure that the employees of Lake Tech County are appropriately paid and compensated. And I, I think um, I will defend that all the way to the end because we have made sure that. We're, so when I came on, we were uh, less than twenty percent of market value for many of the positions. And they talk County, at least in the sheriff's office, and probably in other offices within the county, was known as a training ground for other places. So people who they, they would serve for a while in the, in the sheriff's office, and then they would leave. They'd go to City of Moscow, they'd go off to Seattle, they'd go to another location, but they wanted to your training. And that's very expensive. That's far more expensive for the property taxpayers of Lake Tech County than than not paying people properly, appropriately. So I'm very proud. I think uh, Dave, Dick, and Kathy are probably also proud of making sure that, and I don't want to, I don't want to speak to Commissioner reports in here, but um, that's probably the number one piece because that enables all the other elected officials and all the department heads who represent Lake Tech County to do the very best job they possibly can, whether it's uh, working with youth um, in trouble or adult probation services or, or prosecuting uh, criminals um, or processing election results. You know, we want to make sure that we're paying people well and, and providing the county with the best resources. So, thank you. Well, I obviously haven't had as long a time as either one of these guys did, um, in that office. and. You know, the first thing that came to mind is I somehow survived a year and three quarters working with, with Tom and Dave, but that's, that's sort of tongue, tongue in cheek. Um, we actually do get along really well, well as a team. And, um, 
you know, we, we don't all think the same about everything, and um, there are definitely two to one votes that happen, but there's never disrespect that occurs as a result of that, that two to one vote. We, we exit the building, or we exit the, the boardroom, go back to our offices, and, and it's just, we're, we're good friends, just like we were before that vote. If it's ever something that's extremely important that we feel is really uh, of high consequence, we will work for months to make sure that we come up with consensus so that we're all on the same board. And that's oftentimes not just the two commissioners, but other elected officials as well. We consult a lot with our prosecuting attorney's office, um, civil um, civil things, and we certainly consult always with the auditor regarding, you know, do we have the budget to do this? This is really important. And I feel like we work really, really, really well as a team. Um, as far as like a concrete example, I think one of the things I'm proudest of is the county's response um, to the COVID pandemic. We did coordinate upfront and very early with City of Moscow, University of Idaho, Public Health, and I think our numbers indicate or are reflective of that of that cooperation. We've had, you know, when we were making the decision to close down the buildings and a shutdown a gun show that was was going to be happening at the fairgrounds, and there was a lot of uh, publicity about that. Um, I was up at two o'clock in the morning, and the basic um, thought I had at that point was, if we prevent even one death, it was worth that decision. And I feel like. Not only have we prevented one death, we've saved a lot of lives in our approach um, in this area, and I'm very proud of our response. Thank you. Um, finally, I'd like to give all of you a 90 second opportunity for closing statements. Um, we'll start with Gabe and work our way down. And as you complete your closing statement, um, I would love you to answer my favorite interview question slash favorite panel question um, as you're reminding us of everything that you talked about today. Why should we, the residents of Wichita County, vote for you? Let's start with the real one. Tie it all together. Thank you for having me for this one. Appreciate it. Thank you, Jamie, for being honest. Um, yeah, I, you know, I love Wichita County. It's been such a fantastic place to grow up in, too. I'm like, I started out in college, and now I'm a business man here in the community, and, you know, raising um, three kids. Uh, just love, uh, we love it, you know, the great, uh, you know, we all agree that this is just a fantastic um, uh, town and we, we hope that not too many people find out about it outside of our community. Um, I, as county commissioner, I'll fight for lower taxes, I'll fight for your freedoms, and I'll fight for your business. Um, and one of the travesties in all this is we just, we just own the Constitution out the door, the Idaho State Code it explicitly, it clearly defines that the governor and our local counties do not have the right to quarantine and isolate all the people. And that's what we've done. Everyone's wearing a mask, everyone's been isolated, everyone's been quarantined. And, and on top of that, the government has shut down your businesses. The government has no constitutional ability to shut down your business. Zero results, unless there's some sort of criminal activity going on in your business. But yet we've kind of abandoned all these principles and abandoned our basic Idaho Constitution um, statutes that have been set up nowadays. And, but if, let's, let's just say if, if, as county commissioner, I ever was in some sort of unconstitutional moment to make a decision to shut down their business, I would also not take my county paycheck. To be able to shut down your business and require you not to make money while me taking your, my taxpayer paycheck, that is two different standards, and I'm requiring you to live under a standard that I myself will not place myself under. So I think the response to COVID has actually been very tragic and been very um, a, a, a governmental failure, failure on all of us. What was the question again? Uh, if you could get a 90 second closing statement, but within that, please answer why should we, the residents of Lake Tech County, vote for you? The residents of Lake Tech County should vote for me because they should vote, number one, and Henry and Arlanda at the beginning of this, how they should vote, and because it's just, I don't like it when people vote and only vote the top ballot. You have to go all the way down the ballot, and I'm the only X in that box, so I think that's why you should vote for me. Um, I really appreciate um, having this opportunity today, and I want to give a special shout out to our camera and microphone person. And I can't remember your first name, but I remember the name of your business. So um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Amplify LLC, for all of the equipment that we're using today. Um, I look forward to serving Lake County for another four years as the commissioner for District One. 
Uh, Lake County is growing, and we are all growing older and wiser, I hope. Um, I chose to live here in the 90s when I first moved here, and I chose to live here again in 2010 after my husband died. I will live here for the rest of my life because Lake County is an example of the best that this state has to offer. I am pleased and proud to be part of Team Lake County for the next four years. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, you know, none of us like wearing masks. It really sucks to wear masks, but they've enabled us to keep businesses open, and keep the government open, and I'm very excited that we have that opportunity. And actually, if you want a comfortable mask, I got <laughs> lots of them that I'm giving out. So let me know if you want a mask. Um, I invite you to uh, learn about me and my work uh, as Blake County Commissioner by over the last six years by visiting my, my website, tomlamar.org. Um, there you can learn about my experience as a Wichita County Commissioner, as a, previous, as a City Council member, and appointments that I've received from three other previous Moscow mayors and two governors of the state of Idaho. Um, I've worked with um, uh, private businesses and volunteered with lots of organizations within our community. Um, I love uh, all the uh, different activities that we've had over the years uh, to, to bring and make this community a wonderful place. But the city of Moscow and Lake Talk County are a great place to be, and constantly we're reminded of how wonderful it is. I think people love living here. We see lots of people moving in. Um, I just uh, also want to say that I, I never violated the Constitution in my role as a, either a city council member or as a county commissioner. And, um, at least for the last uh, five and a half, almost six years, um, I've gotten excellent counsel from the man down the table for me, uh, making sure that I don't violate the Constitution in my commissioner role. So I would appreciate your support um, later this fall, which might be next week, because ballots are arriving soon. And thank you uh, to our clerk, County and Westbrook, for helping make our elections safe and accessible for everybody that lives in our county. Thank you. Sheriff Styles, 90 seconds. Well, I'd like to thank Bill, too, because Bill actually kept my office in line. <laughs> Bill did a good job. Um, I would like to thank um, the Chamber, and I would like to thank um, the Board of Realtors, and Jane, and the camera lady, and everybody for it. Um, this has been pretty awesome, and Bill and I kind of got a, didn't have to do a whole lot because we were running on the contested side. I think running uncontested says a lot about what you're doing. Um, I don't, I just am very proud and very honored to be in the position I am in. And I, I've done, we've done a lot of things. The team has done a lot of things. We've worked well together. We've moved um, the sheriff's office to a better place to work at. Um, I think we've helped make Wichita County a safer place to be in. And the support and the emails and the things that I get um, every day um, shows me that um, the, the citizens of Lake County are happy, and I just appreciate that a lot. Um, I'm honored to work for, for Lake County, honored to be the sheriff, and <laughs> you could do a write-in, I guess, but there's, my name's the only one in the box, too. So please vote for me, um, and thank you very much for continued support and all the things that um, you do for us, um, for the sheriff's office, the community um, also helps us do a lot of things and get, get our job done well. And Bill Thompson. Thank you. And gosh, I don't know if I have to say much of anything at all after those endorsements. Um, but I think back to when I first had the opportunity to run for prosecutor back in 1992. And what I ran on at that time was experience, integrity, and common sense. And back then, my experience was 12 years as a lawyer. And holy cow, now it's 40 years, most of it as a prosecutor. I've learned a lot, I've grown, and I think that has added to our ability to provide y'all with the prosecutor's offices that Lake Hawk County deserves. That these people deserve as county officials for our clients and that the citizens deserve. So we have the experience, the integrity, that's number one. We do what's right every single day, and that's a duty of being a prosecutor. We don't answer to a client who tells us what to do. We do what's right. We get to look at ourselves in the mirror in the morning and say, oh my God, I'm glad to be up here. I'm glad that I can make a difference. 
and common sense. You gotta use common sense. The world's not black and white. Uh, if you look outside today, it's certainly not black and white. It's more like gray and red. <laughs> sepia? I like that. Sepia. Um, I can assure you though, that despite what's going on across this country, despite these wildfires, despite COVID, um, Lake Dog County is a great place. We're lucky to be here. And thank you all for sponsoring this today. Thank you for your vote and support. Thank you all for your willingness to serve and for being here today. I'm going to hand it back to Jim Ford for some final uh, statements. Thank you, Jamie. I will be brief for just a couple minutes over our time. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. We know how busy you are. I did want to thank uh, formally a couple other people. So the Best Western Plus University again um, hosted this forum today, set this up for us. We really appreciate that as well as their technical support. Um, uh, Commissioner LaFortune already mentioned Amplify. Amplify LLC is the organization that helped us with the technology today. And uh, the individual's name is Melissa Weiss, also a So, <laughs> yes. Yes. so we truly appreciate that. Um, doing things virtually uh, takes um, a little bit of practice and, and some more time, so we appreciate uh, your patience uh, through that. So, again, we will have a District 5 candidate forum on October 1st um, from 5 30 to 7 p.m. Um, call the Chamber of Commerce or email us if you would like to um, ask some questions specifically to that leadership. But um, to conclude, I just want to say thank you so much to my small audience. It's lovely to see you all. And um, everyone that's uh, um, live streaming, thank you so much for participating. This will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Thank you.